Kia ora and welcome back. So we're just going to jump straight in this time. So what I'm going to put up on the screen here is a system of three equations in three unknowns x, y and z. So they might look like x plus 2y minus z is 0, 3x plus 7y minus 6z is equal to 1, and negative 2x minus 2y minus 3z is equal to 1. So we've got three equations, and we have the three unknowns x, y and z. And what we'd like to be able to do is to find solutions to these equations. That means values of x, y and z that fit all three equations at once. Now you might have studied problems a bit like these in high school under the guise of simultaneous equations. If you're anything like me, you didn't really like doing this very much. Um, to me it seemed like a bit of a dark art figuring out how to eliminate variables without losing things and just ended up chasing my tail half the time. So the good news is we're going to come up with a method of working with these that allow us to solve problems like these very systematically and reliably. Now systematic is really important because it means that what we develop will actually be useful for implementing on a computer in due course. We're not really going to do much of that in this course but in real life we don't usually solve these big systems of equations by hand. We rely on computers to do it because they're fast and accurate. Okay so we um, Maybe you've started to get the hang of the fact that we tend to think about ideas geometrically in this course before we dive into the content. So we'll do the same kind of thing here to take a bit of a look at the geometry of our equations. So look at the system again. Each line of it is actually an equation for a plane. Okay, It's got the x, y, and z with constants in front and a right hand side, exactly the same as the equation, the algebraic equations of planes that we've already been looking at. So what we're doing when we're solving three equations simultaneously is we're saying if I draw three planes at the same time, my solutions are the points that are on all of the planes at once. Alright, so we'll start with the simplest case, which is actually the hardest case to sketch. Um, we'll draw a plane just sitting there in space all by itself, minding its own business. That's our first equation. When we want to represent our second equation, we draw a second plane. And so long as it's not parallel, uh, those two planes will have to somewhere intersect in a straight line. Okay, so now when we add our third one, it doesn't really matter where we put it, as long as it's not parallel with that line we just found, it's going to intersect the two planes, i.e. the line of intersection, in a single point. And that point will be the single x, y, and z value that solves our system. So that's when everything works well. We have three planes, they're not lined up at all, and they intersect in a single unique point. Right, so let's back up a step. What if that third plane had actually been parallel with the line instead of intersecting it? Then what we'd have is a sort of tube, right? Uh, you better, if you held it the right way, you better look down the hole. Um, and there's actually nowhere where all three planes meet at the same time. So if our three planes were arranged like that in space, then there'd actually be no solutions to this uh, to our problem. Or what if the third plane had actually gone through the line, like the line was sitting on the third plane as well, rather than crossing it in a single point. In that case, we'd have this kind of fan of three planes like this, and there'd be infinitely many solutions. Anything on that line would be on all three planes at once, and so would be a solution. So what, it turns out that no matter how many equations we have, or variables we have in our equations, that the number of solutions will always be one of those three cases. There'll either be no solution, like in our second case, there'll be one unique solution, like in our first case, or there might be infinitely many solutions, like in the third case we just looked at. So we need to keep this in mind when we're developing our methods for solving systems, because we shouldn't be surprised when we have things come up that lead to these outcomes. Now before we move on, can you think of any other arrangements of planes that could give us no solutions or infinitely many? I showed you a couple of ways it can be done, but there are others. So maybe just pause the video, see if you can think of a few more and draw some sketches. That's the fun part. Um, and see how you go. Right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to pin down what we're doing and put it on a slightly firmer foundation. So let's start by defining what exactly a linear equation is. So these planes we've been working with, they are linear equations. So the definition is, we'll take our variables x to be an Rn, and we'll let a1 through to an be constants, and also let b be a constant. Okay? When we say element of r, it just means they're real numbers, they're constants. 
whereas the x's are variables. Then a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2 all the way up to a n times x n equals b is a linear equation in x. The definition looks a wee bit technical because of all the symbols, but it's not really. We're just establishing that there are n variables, these are the x1 up to xn, and that the things that multiply the x's, that's the a's, a1 through to an, are called the coefficients. And the term on the right that goes by itself is called the constant term b, and we're just establishing what those things actually are. So easiest to understand this definition by a few examples, so let's check a couple. First off, 3x plus 2y equals 6, there is a linear equation, also like the planes that we've been looking at earlier. 3x plus 2xy equals 6 is nonlinear because we can't have two variables multiplied together in a linear equation, it's not allowed. Any linear equation has to be exactly in the form that we presented in the definition. What about sine theta times x plus cos theta times y plus z equals 1, where theta is 60 degrees? Well, that one looks weird and looks a bit nonlinear, but actually it isn't because theta is constant at 60 degrees. Therefore, sine theta and cosine theta are both constants. Therefore, the things multiplying the variables are all constant, and therefore that is also a linear equation. So just check when you're looking at an equation, each variable should appear by itself without being multiplied by other variables, and there should be no powers of variables or trigonometrificated variables or anything like that. Anything multiplying it must just be a simple constant, even if it's a complicated looking constant like our cosine thetas. All right, so we've got linear equations. Let's look, take our first stab at solving a linear system. So we're gonna start with an easy case, and we're gonna kind of take this as our foundation and then gradually add difficulty into it over the next couple of videos. So we've got a system here of three equations and three unknowns that are in a particularly nice form. So the first equation is x plus 2y minus z equals 0, then y minus 3z equals 1, and then z equals negative 1. We call this upper triangular form, see if you can figure out why. Why is this easy? Well maybe before we move on, have a go at solving it for yourself. See if you can figure out a method of actually systematically solving this particular set of equations. So pause the video, have a go at this yourself, and then come back when you're ready. Right, so hopefully you've had a go at that by now. The key is to start from the bottom of the set of equations and work your way up. So the last one tells us what z is. It says that z is equal to negative 1, so we're partway there already. So what that means is we can then go to the next equation up, which we'll call equation 2, and we can substitute in that value of z to give us y minus 3z equals 1, which makes it y minus 3 times negative 1 equals 1, and we can solve that to give us y is equal to negative 2. So now we have y and z, and all that's left to find is x. So if we now look at the first equation, x plus 2y minus z equals 0, we can substitute in y and z, so it will become x plus 2 times negative 2 minus negative 1 equals 0, which becomes x equals 3. So overall, we better write our solution down as a vector. x, y, z is equal to the vector 3, negative 2, negative 1. So we found one component of the solution at each step there. All right, so this method is called back substitution. So we're going to keep this one, we're going to actually use this one quite a bit because when we are solving a bigger, more complicated system, our strategy will be to turn it into this or something quite similar to it and then use back substitution to get our answer. So this is going to be kind of our fundamental, we're almost there part of the technique. Once we get to this form, we can use back substitution to finish off our solve. Now, writing down all these equations all the time is quite tedious and quite a lot of work, so we're actually going to develop a shorthand for representing these systems. So if we go back to our original example, let's just put it back on the screen there, there it goes. If you just look at the numbers in front of the variables and the right hand sides, to save time we can write this system down as what we call an augmented matrix. We just write the coefficients and right hand side down as a table of numbers, a bit like a spreadsheet. And so we get 1, 2, negative 1, 0 on the first row, 3, 7, minus 6, 1 on the second, negative 2, negative 2, negative 3, 1 on the third. 
So just look at the equations and then look at the matrix and just check you're comfortable with where all those terms came from. So for the first equation, for example, there's a 1 in front of the x, x is by itself, so that corresponds to a 1 in the matrix. There's a 2 in front of the y, so there's a 2 in the matrix there, a negative z, so it's a negative 1 in the matrix, and then 0 for the right-hand side, and similar for each of the rows. We could also do the same thing for our previous our back substitution example. So we had that upper triangular form with our three equations in our augmented matrix. We just write down zeros for the terms that are missing. And so you can sort of see that triangle shape coming into our augmented matrix here. Okay, so um, in general, when we have a matrix, because we're going to be using matrices quite a lot in this course, and for more purposes than just this. So an augmented matrix is a particular type, but in general, if we have a matrix, we talk about a matrix having a certain number of rows and a certain number of columns. Um, so M rows, the one here I've drawn here has M rows and N columns. Remember, rows go sideways, they're sort of on their side, and columns are vertical. So by convention, we usually give matrices uppercase letter names, like capital A here. And to indicate particular entries, we usually use lowercase of the same letter. And then the subscripts, I and J, they indicate what row and what column an entry comes from. So if you look at our general matrix up there, you can see the top left is A11. Um, the one beneath it is A21 because it's in row 2, and etc, etc, etc. Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to practice using this new notation to state our algorithm, which is our, our method for back substitution, a little bit more formally. Right, so suppose we have a system of n equations in n variables. Okay, same number of equations and variables. And that it's in the augmented matrix form shown here. Okay, so it's got all those, it's got that upper triangular shape to it. Um, and I've just filled it in using the notation we just talked about before, using the A's and the subscripts. Okay, so one extra restriction, we have to have A, I, I, which are called the diagonal entries, the kind of the first entry in each row of the matrix. They all have to not equal zero. Otherwise, what we're about to say is not going to work. Then we can solve this upper triangular system by back substitution using the following procedure. So first off, if we look at the last equation, that represents ANN times XN equals BN. So rearranging that, we get XN is equal to BN divided by ANN. Okay, fine. Uh, now we go to the next equation up. That's AN minus 1, N minus 1 times XN minus 1. It's a bit horrible to write down. Uh, plus AN minus 1, N times XN is equal to BN minus 1. And I can rearrange that to solve for xn minus 1 using the xn that I already now have, which gives me xn minus 1 is 1 over a n minus 1 n minus 1 times b n minus 1 minus, oh my goodness, it's so hard to say all these n's. You can read it, minus a n minus 1 n x n. I don't think me saying n's is going to help anybody one little bit, but hopefully you can read it off the screen. All right, so literally all I'm doing is writing down the equation that the row of the matrix represents and then rearranging it for the leftmost of the x's. So moving on, I can do the same thing for xn minus 2. Notice I've got two extra pieces now, one for my xn minus 1 term and one for my xn term. Continuing on for the general entry xk, so I've gone back to some point in the middle, it's equal to 1 over akk. It's already always divides by that diagonal entry. And then times bk, that's the right-hand side. Now, I've collected all the extra pieces, the a's times the x's, into a special notation called a sum, and I'll explain that in a minute. But just that, basically, that term with the capital Greek letter sigma just represents a sum of terms, okay, just to kind of make it a bit tidier. And I can continue on and go all the way down to x1 is equal to that expression there, 1 over a11 times b1 minus a sum of these extra terms. Right, so that's quite cool. Um, let's just quickly take a quick quick diversion and, and explain what that sigma notation or that sum notation actually means. So the sigma is a way of representing a sum, i.e. adding a bunch of terms up. So we write the big letter sigma. Um, the bits above and below it give the range of i values. So the sum from i equals 2 to n means we're going to start at 2. 
we're going to go up to n and then the expression to the right of the um, sigma is basically going to have all the different values of i substituted into it and then the whole lot is going to be added up at the end. Uh, so this particular one I've written down here, the sum from i equals 2 to n of xi. Basically I'm going to plug in i equals 2, i equals 3, all the way up to i equals n. So and then add them all up. So I'll get x2 plus x3 all the way up to xn, which is what I have when i equals n. A couple more examples. If I have, for example, the sum from k equals 3 to 7 of k squared, that just equals 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 5 squared plus 6 squared plus 7 squared. k started at 3 and then went as high as 7 and that was the last one. If there's a negative sign to the left, which should just be a little bit careful, there's kind of an implied set of parentheses here. So we just expand the sum, just remembering there have to be parentheses around the whole lot. So negative, the sum of a i x i from 1 to n is negative, big set of parentheses, a1 x1 plus a2 x2 all the way up to a n x n. All right, so let's just jump back to what we had before. Um, you can see now why how that sum notation is quite useful. And the way, the reason we actually write this thing down formally, right, or a bit more precisely rather than just kind of describing the routine and doing it, is that once we have it written a bit more formally, that's really good for computer implementation. It's, it's easier to transcribe an algorithm that's been specified like this than one that's a little bit more wishy-washy. Okay, again, we'll sort of park that thought for now. Um, and don't forget those AIs being non-zero, we can now see why that was, because they appear as one divided by AKK or A11 or A22. So if they were zero, that would mess up the whole thing. All right, so I think that's probably enough for this particular class. So to wrap up, um, we have done the following things in this video. We've, we can now recognize what linear equations are. We can convert between augmented matrices and systems of equations. Um, we can solve systems by back substitution, so long as they're of the right form. And we also know that we should expect when we are developing our more general method that we could have either no solutions to our systems one unique solution or infinitely many. So that's something we're just going to have to keep reminding ourselves about because that's what happens when things appear at first sight to have gone wrong. So we'll call it a day um, and we'll catch you next time. Kakite ano.